And what happens is Satan sends men with other doctrines. They're biblical, but they're just not dispensational. They use the Bible. They, they go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and talk about Jesus and his earthly ministry, but that's not talking to you today. Paul says Jesus Christ, according to the mystery, has to do with what he's doing in the heavenly places. See, don't be tossed to and fro and be confused. Satan wants you to be confused, but God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in every church of the saints, okay? Look what he says. So, so as these winds of doctrine come, these teachings, these biblical teachings, but aren't rightly divided, by the slight of men, you know what that means, they trick you with their hands. The old ball trick, you know, they say, well, which cup is the ball, on, which cup is the ball under, and they switch it around on you. Well, that's what they do with the Bible. They just take stuff from over here in James and Revelation, over here some Genesis and some Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mix it up with Paul, and then they, they got you all confused. Sleight of hand. The hand is quicker than the eye, right? And cunning craftiness. They're cunning. In fact, that's something that the Bible says about Satan. He's cunning. He's crafty. Craftiness means they trick you. They get you. They, they, they purposely go out to, to take from you, to spoil you. Look what, look what he says. Whereby, Ephesians 4, verse 14, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. See, Satan wants to deceive you because this message of the mystery explains his downfall. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, that we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, that Satan and his, his fallen angels, his demonic angels. For had they known this mystery, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had Satan known that God would reconcile the heavenly places where Satan and his dominions lived in there, okay? They're up there. And one day the body of Christ will take over those positions. If Satan would have known that, my friend, that God would use someone like you and certainly someone like me who just believe his word, to, to, for, for eternity in, the, in those heavenly places, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He would have allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to go ahead and give Israel that earthly kingdom, but Satan was still had the heavenly places. But guess what God did? Through the cross of Christ, God has reconciled both not, not only the earth, but the heavenly places. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the what? Heaven and the earth. The first verse of the Bible, God shows you what he plans to do. He's doing something in the heavens and the earth. And today, Paul explains what God is doing in the heavens. That's why you need to know Paul's epistles so you know where you fit in. Okay? Well, look. He says in verse 15, Ephesians 4, verse 15, but speaking the truth, and that's this present truth, the mystery of Christ, speaking the truth in love, speaking about us, may grow up in, into him in all things. See, God expects us to grow up in Christ, to be formed, to be conformed to the image of his son in our thinking. See, when you think the way Paul tells, we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 says. When you think like him, guess what? You start to act like him. See, a thinking process. Renew your mind. You think the way Christ says to think through Paul's epistles. Then you'll start to act and labor with him, wouldn't you? Look at that. Grow up into him, Ephesians 4, 15. In all things, which is the head, even Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the center of everything that God is doing and will ever do in, in, in all eternity. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ and his cross work is the center. Now, this wasn't made known until the Apostle Paul was saved in Acts 9. And it's not made known in anything else but Romans through Philemon's, the 13 letters of Paul. But this is something the Bible says God had hid in himself from before the, the foundation of the earth. Read 1 Corinthians 2. This is the info that will make you grow in Christ. This info, what Paul wrote in Romans through Philemon, will form Christ in you. And that's the info that the Galatians left. They left their apostle Paul. Go back to the book of Galatians, if you will. Galatians chapter 4. So Paul says, look at verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Look at verse 20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. When he says to be present, he loved them. Paul wanted to be there with them. 
He sought restoration. Earlier he said in verse 16, if you look, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They had accounted the apostle Paul as an enemy because he was telling them truth. You know, my friend, the truth of God's word. You know, if you've never heard about this mystery, that means you just haven't been taught it, most likely. And if you have heard about it and you don't believe it, then that's the problem. See, truth, it, it, it has a, a way of rubbing you the wrong way. Now, how do you handle that? Well, you humble yourself before the mighty word of God. And you allow God's word to be the issue and not your own pride. That's what they did. They allowed their own pride, their religious pride, to get in the way of the truth. And Paul had to write this letter and say, look, have I become your enemy, verse 16, because I tell you the truth? Well, he says, hopefully he hasn't. Look at verse 20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. He says, I, I love you. I wish I could be there to speak to you face to face so that I can change my voice. He had to be stern with them. But for the truth of God that he was zealous about, Paul would be stern with anyone. OK, they had to humble themselves. Look at verse 20 at the end. For I stand in doubt of you. You know what that means? He was he stood in doubt of them because of their unbelief. He didn't believe that they could recover themselves because they were so hard hearted towards the Apostle Paul and God's word through him. He sought their restoration, though. He didn't give up on them. That's why he wrote the letter. And my friend, if you don't know this truth committed to the Apostle Paul, if you don't understand it and acknowledge it and know it, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart like the nation of Israel did when God's word came through Moses and the prophets or how the body of Christ has hardened their heart towards the Apostle Paul and what he wrote in 13 books of the Bible more than any other man ever wrote, okay? Soften your heart towards this word and believe the word of God through your apostle. Look at verse 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? When Paul says they desire to be under the law, he's saying your desire to be under a yoke of bondage. Paul has already proven the scriptures has already proven that the, the law of Moses was a yoke of bondage because man, because of his sinfulness, could not keep it, now watch this, perfectly. You know, my friend, you can't be justified by the Ten Commandments or, or any of the 613 commandments that God gave the nation of Israel through Moses because you can't keep them perfectly. First of all, you don't even know all six, uh, 613 of them, do you? I've ran into people who claim they keep the Ten Commandments, and when I ask them, name them, they don't even know t the Ten Commandments. Now, how could they keep the Ten Commandments if they don't even know them? You know, you know you don't keep them perfectly even if you did know them, don't you? No, because we're sinners. And instead of being, trying to be righteous before God in our own works, why don't we just trust the perfect one, his son who died to pay for our sins and gave us, when we trust him, his righteousness.